Welcome back, everyone. Just a quick recap of last week. We started thinking about the idea of crime prevention, and we noted that crime prevention rests on various assumptions. These are assumptions about how the world works,、uh, what kind of society、uh, we want to live in, what forms of Social control may be acceptable, and we noted that crime prevention can be a politically charged topic as well. We also noted how crime prevention isn't something that is simply instrumental, but that there is a symbolic dimension to it as well. It communicates back to the society the. Values and vision of both the government or the state, I should say, and the society itself. And this vision is about how things should be, how things should be run, and so on. This week, we are going to look at, well, three broad areas, I guess. The preventive turn and its. Socio-political historical context. Then we will look at administrative and critical theories of prevention, and then we will have a bit of an examination of the routine activity theory model、uh, and its amendments. So, routine activity theory informs this crime triangle model. Um, and then other theorists and thinkers have come in and made a few adjustments as well to build upon that and improve it. Now it's not that crime prevention is a completely new phenomenon, but in terms of how it's understood in Contemporary society, we can sort of identify three broad periods relating to the emergence、uh, and mainstreaming of crime prevention thinking and practices. This first period is during、uh, the nineteen eighties up till the nineteen nineties, and. This is where prevention starts to gain more and more national prominence in Western countries, such as the UK and so on. And then the next period after that is from the mid nineties until the late sort of two thousands, where it starts to become incorporated as key governance strategy. So it's gone from, you know, rising prominence. Starts to be incorporated into key strategies, and then the third broad period is from the austerity decade,、um, which is you know two thousand and eight onwards till today. Now, of course, that term austerity decade is referring to the political economic context after the global financial crisis, the GFC of o seven o eight, and. During this period, we've seen an intensification of social problems alongside an ideological shift away from public provision. This push, this austerity push towards less public spending, and as a result, a reframing of interagency relationships. Now, talking about the preventive turn.、Um, You know, just think of this as a label for a point in time at which, you know, criminological focus has started to shift towards,、um, you know, prevention rather than purely reactive or responsive、uh, methods of managing crime. And a lot of the preventive turn and indeed our common sense ideas about crime. Are actually influenced by what we call classical liberal philosophy, and this emerged during the 18th century. And one of the key ideas associated with classical liberal philosophy
is this concept homo prudens. So this is obviously a play on the term homo sapiens and so on. And this refers to basically the idea of a rational man uh, who lives their life according to utilitarian principles. So what this is all saying is that classical liberal philosophers assumed that human beings were rational and that they, you know, made each of their life choices according to this utilitarian approach, which means maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. So that's in the background of the assumptions about, you know, uh, criminal behavior, right? Now, in the last 40 years or so, crime prevention as a philosophy and practice has come under more, you know, scholarly scrutiny. And part of this is due to the rising crime rates uh, during the 1960s and 70s. And this rehabilitative ideal, the idea that we respond to crime by uh, helping to rehabilitate offenders, um, started to lose favour what you may have heard referred to as welfareist approaches to crime were sort of replaced by what we call a newfound pessimism. People were sort of more cynical about the possibility of rehabilitation. Uh, since that time, crime prevention has been mostly what we call situational, which means focusing on protecting uh, things like property via target hardening, which in turn means manipulating the physical environment to reduce the opportunities for crime. A really simple example of this is, you know, putting up a fence or a gate or a lock. So situational prevention has been the sort of prevailing view since the 1980s, especially in places such as the United Kingdom and so on. Now, situational approaches are at the expense of more socially oriented approaches. Situational approaches focus more on the specific time and place of an act or event of crime and tends not to focus as much on broader uh, sociological type factors. Situational prevention is informed by routine activity theory and rational choice theories. We'll talk about routine activity theory in a bit more detail later on in the lecture, but the rational choice theories you can sort of think of as a philosophical continuation of the classical liberalism we mentioned in the previous slide. Now, underlying situational prevention are a few points that we've got up here on the slide. Now, it involves a range of practical and pragmatic approaches, and that's going to be key to understanding the broader sort of situational approach. Um, We've got a definition here, one possible definition, which is that situational prevention relates to the management, design, or manipulation of the immediate physical environment to reduce opportunities for specific crimes. Now, this situational approach um, challenged conventional criminological thinking because instead of focusing on deviance and the criminality of behavior in itself, this approach started looking at the situational context and the opportunities that surround or inform criminal acts or criminal events. So what this means is that the shift uh, has been towards looking at particular you know, time and space specific occurrences of crime and looking at the immediate factors rather than appealing to more abstract social, political, economic, structural issues. Situational prevention also 
incorporates this principle of regulated self-regulation. Again, linking back to the idea of rational man and classical liberal philosophy. So, for example, and you've probably seen this yourself, you'll see signs or warnings that remind the public about the consequences of rule-breaking. You may think back to signs you see at parks and such telling you not to litter, don't camp here, there's a fine of X many dollars, and so on. And importantly, it's worth noting that over time, the thinking behind situational prevention has also moved on from target hardening, what we call bars, bolts, and barriers, to more protective and total surveillance. CCTV, security cameras, but also things like monitoring phone calls, SMS, Facebook posts, the sort of things that you may have heard news stories about the NSA in America, um, you know, surveilling people's uh, online materials and so on. Now, moving on, we also have this idea of community safety, which presents a philosophical shift in crime prevention practice. Now, this is an approach to crime prevention that removes it from a police-focused silo, and instead prevention becomes uh, a task for the whole community. Uh, a lot of the early sort of movement around this uh, was in the UK and took the form initially of local projects with short-term funding and a coordinator. Now, community safety approaches try to incorporate a wide range of organisations and interests to then work on local crime problems and prevention. Now, this means shifting away from, you know, it being centred mostly around the state and now including local businesses, the local community, the public sector, non-government organisations, and so on, coordinating their activities and coming up with locally grounded strategies of crime prevention. Now, the term community safety is sometimes preferred over the term crime prevention because it's felt that crime prevention has too close an association with what we might call traditional police work. Community safety opens up the activity to a little bit of a broader interpretation, and the hope is that this will encourage greater participation across the community. And it also allows, um, or functions as an umbrella term, to help allow the combination of both situational and social approaches. So let's talk about some of those social uh, approaches. Now, sometimes it's also thought of as developmental crime prevention when we talk about social crime prevention. But broadly speaking, we're talking about interventions that try to address the dispositions of individuals who offend and the root causes of crime. So this is taking a step back from the immediate situation of the act of crime and trying to modify the attitudes and intentions and beliefs and so on of potential offenders. So these are interventions that reduce individual motivations to offend. Some of the ways that we try to achieve this is by addressing social influences and institutions of socialization, you know, schools and so on, and altering social relationships and the social environment through collective focus on communities, neighborhoods, and social networks. It's about um, ensuring that potential offenders become more invested in their own society and the community within which they live. Now, a lot of this sort of thinking is informed by the broken windows thesis, which is referring to the assumption that low-level behavioural problems, 
uh, indications of more serious criminality in the future and that these low-level problems need to be prevented early to stop them escalating into more serious crime later on. Now, this section where, um, you know, drawing a lot more on this week's assigned reading, and we're looking at the frameworks around crime prevention theories and some of the underlying assumptions. And it's important to remember that crime prevention is situated in specific discourses, right, ways of thinking and talking, about society and preferred forms of social control. As a result, crime prevention makes specific sociological assumptions about the individual and society. For example, do we take the classical liberal view about people as rational men, for example? And, you know, I implied in my comment there is the sort of gendered assumptions as well. Or do we make other assumptions about how individuals and the society they uh, live in interact with each other? So there's broad agreement among criminological thinkers on the general principle of prevention, but there is much disagreement about the actual practice. And that is a result of the frameworks and assumptions through which we enact crime prevention. Some criminologists take a what works approach, and we can think of this as an administrative approach or administrative framework, while more, shall we say, skeptical criminologists take what we call a critical approach or operate under a critical framework. Now, when we talk about administrative approaches or administrative frameworks, we're talking about those ways of thinking that, you know, want to identify the most effective prevention and crime reduction methods and use knowledge about that to inform, you know, other crime prevention policies and practices. Related to this view is the assumption that turning our knowledge about the social structural uh, causes of crime, you know, such as addressing inequality or other social structural root causes, is actually a really unwieldy, too difficult sort of task because it will require ostensibly impossible social transformations at great cost and with uncertain results. So instead, administrative frameworks sort of claim they push for a scientific agenda using experimental methods and empirical investigation to identify those successful prevention practices and policies, i.e. Uh, what works. Now, having said that, not all criminologists share a faith in this um, scientific approach. And it's not to say that criminologists sort of reject science and objectivity completely outright, it's just saying that this particular form of scientific approach may not be quite what we think it is. Now this scientific faith sort of suggests um, or frames government as just an administrative practice, right? Just management of things. However, in practice we've seen that translating this evidence-based philosophy into actual projects and programs has actually turned out um, to be more difficult than we first anticipated. Now having said that, in our current you know, political economic climate of managerialism and neoliberalism and all of those other isms that you may have come across in different courses. It is hard to argue against what, on the surface at least, seems like a rational and cost-effective way of approaching crime. 
particularly in Western countries such as Australia, that have really sort of, you know, signed up to this worldview. On the other hand, we have critical approaches or critical frameworks. Now, when we say critical, we don't just mean someone nitpicking or criticising for the sake of criticising. But really, what critical frameworks are talking about are, well, on the one hand, the first thing is, they kind of see these administrative approaches as simply subservient to government, right? That the administrative uh, criminology informing crime prevention tends to just be more instrumental and in service of whatever the government of the day wants to do. Um, instead, critical approaches state that prevention needs to be situated in its specific political and economic context. Now, what that means is sort of not just taking for granted that the policies of government or the views espoused by public discourse are necessarily, you know, good or true or neutral or anything like that, but also understanding how certain political, economic and social factors may be shaping what passes or what is accepted as a policy goal or ideal. Instead, crime prevention is understood as part of a broader responsabilization strategy. Now, that means individuals and communities accept more of the burden of managing their own safety and security problems. Now, with that come certain assumptions and ideals about the role of the state in the individual or the society's day-to-day -day life. More of the political context that uh, critical frameworks want to sort of shine a light on um, is that crime prevention practices from the late 20th century onwards seem to be driven by a neoliberal agenda. Broadly speaking, what that means is that the state doesn't have the capacity for full crime control. It either recognises it doesn't have that capacity or it rejects that capacity. It means that private citizens, commercial enterprises and community groups come together and in turn function as active partners in the co-production of safety and security, which effectively means that a range of actors, a diverse range of social actors, not just the government, not just the state anymore, are assumed or desired to come together, to work together in a sort of inter-agency cooperation, different groups working together, and in that sort of joint work, that joint effort, they come up with some kind of plan or way of managing their own safety and security instead of relying on the state to do this. As such, we might frame prevention as a managerialist approach. It tends to be, uh, you know, thinking in terms of cost benefits, fiscal responsibility, and, you know, reducing the size and cost of the public sector, while at the same time improving the efficiency of the public sector. Now, it's easy to fall into this trap of an either-or kind of mindset, that either you're an administrative or a critical um, crime prevention criminologist. But something to keep in mind is that both approaches treat prevention as an instrumental task. And you'll remember last week I talked about um, you know, the difference between instrumental approaches and so on. Now remember, when we are talking about instrumental approaches, we're just talking about something that's kind of treated uncritically as a set of tools or techniques without really thinking about any broader you know, social or political context. And it's important to remember that, as mentioned last week, prevention has this symbolic and expressive dimension. For example, governments and citizens 
signal or express their preferred vision of society and social control through the crime prevention methods that they accept and reject. Yeah. And so what this week's reading is kind of suggesting is that crime prevention as a you know broad set of practices could provide the chance to get past this administrative versus critical distinction and kind of incorporate um, recognition of these symbolic and expressive and affective elements of crime prevention to provide a more nuanced and holistic uh, approach. Now this brings us to the routine activities theory model, which um, comes from some of the work by Marcus Felsen. And this model serves as a useful guide and helps highlight some of the limitations of punitive responses. Now, in this model, crime is produced by the intersection of three factors at a specific time and place. These factors include a motivated offender, a potential target, and the absence of capable guardianship now, when we say target, this can include both people and property. When we talk about guardianship, or capable guardianship, well, we're talking about human actors, as well as security devices and technology. For example, parents, security, personnel, CCTV, security cameras, alarms locks, that sort of thing. But guardianship can also be formal and informal guardianship as well, so we might even talk about bystanders and witnesses at the scene, and these can be thought of as other forms of surveillance and social control. So what's useful about this model is that it also incorporates non-human aspects in crime. So not just thinking about people, but also thinking about the material dimensions of crime, be it the property, the target, or be it security technology and so on. All of these are incorporated into a socio-material model. Now just a few comments on the routine activities theory model. And it kind of suggests that crime is not always necessarily a sign of social decline. You know, the authors of this week's reading suggest that crime could also be the unwanted side effect of social developments and improvements. For example, living in a wealthier society means that there's simply more things to steal and more chances to steal. However, the routine activities theory, you know, sits alongside this mindset of situational prevention, and it sort of dismisses the possibility of changing human nature, or at least it doesn't really take that into account or as a consideration. Now, different thinkers have criticized the model for this dismissal, whereas the model thinks, well, you know, it's not our place or not our ability to, to change human nature, so let's not try. Uh, there may be certain situations, uh, one example would be domestic violence, where there may actually be a moral or ethical obligation on the part of society or on the part of those charged with the task of preventing crime. Um, there may be an obligation to actually try to change the offender motivations and behaviours rather than just taking them for granted. Now one of the uh, possible consequences of this approach, dismissing the possibility of changing human nature, you know, not just, just focusing on the situational aspect, is that it sometimes places too much of the prevention burden on the potential target or victim of crime. 
Now, one of the consequences of that is that we run the risk of victim blaming under this model. Now, the routine activities theory um, has also been modified by other thinkers. Now, Felsen's routine activities theory emphasizes what we call proximal factors. Proximal being another word for immediate factors. So it's looking at the proximal role of offenders, victims, and guardians. At the expense of distal, or more distant and indirect, influence of social institutions and structures. So a scholar called Eck has provided this modified triangle where there's an outer triangle and an inner triangle. And the outer triangle is the controller's level. And the controllers can be thought of as guardians, which are more or less the same people as in the previous model, but also handlers and managers. Handlers are people with influence over potential offenders, and managers are people who have control over the places or sites where crime can occur. So you can see how this is a step back from the immediate intersection of potential target of motivated offender and absence of capable guardianship. And is a, an attempt to incorporate these more distal social factors. Now, inside that controller's level is the problem level, where you have a potential victim or target, the offender, and the place where this happens. So this modification of the model is taking into account the spatial and the social dimensions of the event of crime, and then we can use that to try and interpret, think about, and come up with crime prevention practices and strategies. Now just a few comments on X um, modification. Now it helps highlight crime as a product of social processes, as well as specific interactions at particular times and places. So it's not just situational techniques to manage the inner triangle, the proximal aspects of crime, but we also need techniques that address the outer triangle, the distal aspects, the social processes that are indirectly affecting the emergence of criminal um, acts or events. Now something to keep in mind is that the benefits of addressing these distal factors uh, may be more long-term and significant. That being said, governments tend to opt for routine and politically safe solutions. You know, there's an imperative to put some kind of program into place quickly, um, and something that will present you know fast and easily interpretable outcomes. And this. Um, political reality is often shaped by law and order politics and a so-called law and order common sense. Um, and that idea of law and order common sense um, is quite um, neatly articulated by Brown and Hogg. Um, but basically when we say law and order common sense, we're talking about these taken for granted assumptions that crime is always getting worse and governments aren't doing anything, the sort of shock jock, um, a current affairs style uh, claims that aren't necessarily actually grounded in fact, but we kind of, you know, take on for granted or assumed um, as, you know, what's really the case. Now, there's also a problem-solving aspect to crime prevention approaches. Um, and the argument is that prevention programs need to be underpinned by a systemic planning and a problem-solving approach. Now, this seems sort of obvious, but as I mentioned in the last slide, there is ongoing political pressure 
to get programs up and running. Now, that aside, it's worth um, thinking about prevention as something that is problem-oriented rather than practice-oriented. That means, you know, approaching crime prevention and focusing on the specific problem at hand rather than the different practices or techniques um, that are already in existence. So it's sort of like the dif the difference, I should say, um, between looking at what is this specific crime problem we need to address and then developing a solution and, on the other hand, um, oh, look, we've got a set of uh, preset techniques that we've used before, so which one lines up with the, the immediate problem? Now, as a result of this problem-oriented approach, our preconceptions about crime should not determine how a specific crime problem is addressed. So that means we need to develop an understanding of the situation and the context and apply that and apply that to our crime prevention approach we can't make you know assumptions about the problem at hand based on no evidence we need to develop evidence about the problem now just a few more points about this problem solving aspect of crime prevention building on what was said in the last slide this means that Strategies uh, should be developed to match the specific nature of the crime and the specific safety problems present in particular locations. Another way of putting this is that prevention should be situation and context sensitive rather than off-the-shelf solutions. So this is the whole problem-oriented versus practice-oriented approach. To be situation and context sensitive recognizes that different crime problems at different places and different times are unique. And we can't always apply the same solutions rigidly um, to a new context. So we need to be sensitive to the different conditions, the different communities, risks, resources, and so on. Now, as part of this problem-solving approach, prevention needs to incorporate what you might call a response loop. That is, our practices should be subjected to evaluations that help assess the impacts of those interventions that feeds back into prevention strategies. And in this way, prevention is understood as an iterative process. Now, when we say iterative, it just means um, you go through several versions of something, right? So what that means is that prevention um, builds upon feedback. This feedback can lead to further modifications, or maybe we abandon the project, or maybe we start over and try again. So what are some key points that we've um, covered today that we want to keep in mind? Well, we talked about the preventive turn um, and the sort of legacy of classical liberal thinking in terms of crime, this idea of homo prudens, and the abandonment of welfareist approaches. And then we talked about this idea of situational prevention community safety, and social or developmental prevention. Now that led into our consideration of administrative and critical approaches, right? And remember that it's not really a case of either or, but just being aware that these two sort of frameworks exist. We talked a bit about the routine activities theory, with its guardianship, target, and offender triangle. And then we talked about X uh, model 
which is a modification of the routine activities theory that was originally posited by Felsen. And in this model, there are two layers. The inner layer was fairly similar to the original routine activities model, but the outer layer had a controller's layer with guardians, handlers, and managers, and that layer is helping to account for some of the more distal or distant social uh, and structural causes, as opposed to the inner triangle, which addressed the more immediate um, you know, uh, issues in the event of the crime itself. And then we had a bit of a chat about some of the problem-solving aspects related to crime prevention, that it should be situation and context sensitive, that there should be some sort of response loop. In this case, we're talking about evaluations and feedback, and that the task of crime prevention is an iterative one. You know, you may go through several versions of the process uh, as you refine and try and achieve those outcomes and goals. Now, here are a few things to think about um, over the course of this week. Why is it important to be aware of these frameworks and typologies? This is something you should uh, try to answer to yourself. What are the main elements of the routine activities model and its um, you know, modification by Eck? Which framework or theory or approach resonates most with you and why do you think that is? Okay. And can crime prevention be reduced to a straightforward evidence-based process? And why or why not might this be the case? So these are just questions to help you engage further with the material, um, you know, and try and get you thinking about some of the stuff we've talked about uh, in this lecture. We've covered um, a lot of material, um, and the main thing is to understand this sort of broader theoretical um, backdrop before we delve into more specific uh, approaches in future weeks. And just before we wrap up, let's have a quick chat about next week. Week 3, Fear of Crime, Politics and Crime Policy. And your reading for next week is Lee, 2007, Chapter 6, Governing the Fearful and Inventing the Feared. Now, while you're reading through this and preparing for next week, have a think about um, some of these questions below. Think about this idea of the fear of crime and its relationship to crime prevention. Importantly, have a think about how fear or the fear of crime is something that is addressed by crime prevention. That means crime prevention techniques seek to manage the fear of crime. And also have a think about how the fear of crime is something that can be used to address crime prevention, meaning the fear of crime can be part of the techniques used to enact crime prevention itself. Now, this may seem a bit abstract or a bit sort of confusing or circular, but if you keep that in your mind while uh, reading through next week's reading and preparing and so on, um, hopefully uh, you'll start to see uh, what we're getting at here. Alright, so good luck, and I'll see you all next week.